Do you love Night Falls, California? Do you want to know how we make it? Join us for Breakfast at the Redwood, where we take you behind the scenes for an in-depth discussion with the show's creators. Listen now on nightfallsmedia.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And now, welcome back to Night Falls, California. About 20 minutes have passed since Charlie arrived. I still sit in the Cooper family's kitchen, scribbling in my notebook various questions I could ask Charlie during our interview. I'm not making much progress. Every time I write something down, I end up just scratching it out. I'm at a total loss. How do you even begin to approach something like this? This is an interview I never would have expected to even be possible. I feel slightly guilty, like I'm in the way. Charlie Cooper just went through what I would expect to be the hardest two weeks of her life. That she can remember, anyway. And here I am, an outsider, coming to ask her a bunch of questions that she's probably had to answer a million times in the past two weeks. Eventually, I give up, dropping my pen and closing my notebook with a sigh. Across from me is Nancy Cooper. She sits silently reading a tattered paperback book. Based on the cover, it appears to be either a romance novel or a detective story. Possibly both. I think about saying something, to make slight conversation, but then decide against it. I hear the front door open and lean back in my chair to see who it is. Travis Warren enters the house and wanders around the living room, searching for something. We lock eyes for a moment, and he smiles and waves. This is the first time I've seen Travis in a little over a week. I'm a little shocked at how different his appearance is. He looks healthy. He's clearly been spending a bit more time outside, as his once pallid face now has a slight tan, and his hair, while still long and unkempt, now at least appears to have been washed in the last couple of days. The same can be said of his wardrobe. The clothes he's wearing are weathered and old, but aren't encrusted with mud and dirt like they once were. Travis mouths something to me. I shoot him a puzzled glance and motion for him to come to the kitchen. He shakes his head and points to my right. I look ahead at Nancy Cooper still reading her book. I turn back to Travis, realizing why he's acting so strange. Again, he mouths something to me, this time accompanying it with a hand gesture. He draws a square in front of him, and I'm able to make out one of the words. Boxes. Understanding, I point towards the pile of donation boxes sitting by the door. Travis looks down at them, smacks his forehead, then turns back to me and mouths thank you. He crouches down, grabs a couple of boxes, and walks out the door. He makes a couple more trips, and as he carries the last set of boxes out the door, he turns back to me and nods his head in acknowledgement. I wave goodbye to him as he pulls the door closed behind him. A moment later, I hear his truck start up in the driveway. Almost simultaneously, my phone buzzes. I pick it up and see that I've received a text from Travis. Sorry for acting so weird, it reads. Didn't want to cause a scene. Any chance you can swing by my place later? I need to talk to you about something. Intrigued, I reply that I can make my way over as soon as I'm done talking to Charlie. Just as I hit send, Sydney Cooper walks into the kitchen. Quickly, I put my phone away. She makes her way over to the table, pulls out a chair, and sits down next to me. All right. I think you're good to go up now. Does she know that I'm here to interview her? Yeah. I explained everything to her. And she doesn't mind? I don't think she will. Just don't be weird about it. I mean, I wasn't planning to. I'm messing with you. Mostly. Go on up. I have to figure out what I'm going to do with all the crap in my garage. With that, she stands back up and walks out of the kitchen, heading towards the garage. I sit for a moment, collecting my thoughts, preparing myself. I leaf through my notebook, searching for something in there that could possibly help me be ready for what it is I'm about to do, knowing that there's nothing of the sort. I had all this time to prepare, and I wasn't able to come up with a single thing. Finally, I decide that waiting won't help anything. The only thing to do is walk up the stairs and talk to Charlie. And after stuffing my notebook back into my messenger bag, that's exactly what I do. Charlie stands in the center of her room, slowly turning as she inspects her surroundings. She doesn't notice me as I stand in the doorway. My gut reaction is to immediately turn around and go back down the stairs before she sees me. But I don't. I can't. Instead, I knock on the doorframe as I say... Mind if I come in? She jumps at the sound of my voice and spins to face me. Jesus, you scared me. I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to. I was just... It's okay. Sorry. I said it was okay. Right. 
You're Scott? I am. Sydney's reporter friend. I'm caught off guard slightly by that description. Uh, yes. Sid told me about you. And your little project. She did? She did. She's been catching me up on everything that's happened since... Well. And I'm glad. Because when I woke up, I was very confused about the weird guy in my hospital room holding a microphone. She crosses her arms and smirks as she says this. It takes all of my willpower not to immediately bolt down the stairs and out of the house in shame. I'm sorry about that. I guess it was sort of an invasion of privacy being there. (laughs) I stop speaking as Charlie begins to laugh. I have the strangest sense of deja vu as she does so. Sid told me you get flustered very easily. I had to see if she was right. I, uh... I'm sorry. That was mean. No, don't be. (laughs) She's right. And you're not the first person that's done that. Or the second. Oh, no. (laughs) Well, now I feel really bad. Please don't. Let's start over. Charlie walks over to me and extends her hand. Charlie Cooper. Scott Sinclair. I reach out to shake Charlie's hand. As our hands touch, I feel a jolt-like static electricity running up my arm. I make eye contact with her. Her eyes are hazel, like Sydney's. But something is different about them. Sydney's eyes are like windows that allow you to see through to the person hiding underneath. With Charlie, it's the opposite. I feel her gaze pierce through me, as though she's looking back at everything that's happened in my life, finding secrets I didn't even know I had. In that moment, I realize what everyone else must have already known for years. There's something more to Charlie Cooper. As these thoughts rush through my head, I realize that Charlie has been saying something to me, and I haven't heard a word of it. I'm sorry, what? I said I like your name. It sounds like a superhero's secret identity. (laughs) Oh, thank you. I think. Charlie lets go of my hand and walks over to her bed. She sits down and taps the space next to her. Come, take a seat, Scott Sinclair. Oh, no. Thank you, though. Come on, sit. I'll feel weird if you don't. Oh. Okay. Sheepishly, I walk over to Charlie's bed and sit next to her. She smiles, then scoots back onto the bed and sits cross-legged. See? That's better. So, this project of yours... Yes. What exactly is it supposed to be, anyway? I don't really know anymore, actually. When I came to town, it was going to be one thing, but then... But then... I showed up. Right. Sorry to throw a wrench into your plans. No, you didn't. Uh, Of course you didn't. I'm glad you're safe. It's just... Really not a situation I was prepared for. You and everyone else, apparently. I don't mean to sound like I thought you'd never be seen again, but... But you did. You need to understand just how big a deal what happened to you was. To everyone. Oh, I've heard all about it. What was that Twitter thing? What happened to Charlie? Yeah. It sounds very exciting. I'm sorry I missed out on it all. I missed out on a lot of things, actually. I know. Of course you do. You know my entire life story, it seems, better than I do. Well, I wouldn't go that far. I'm exaggerating. Oh. (laughs) You know, for a reporter, you're really bad at this. I'm... what? You came up here to interview me, right? Well, yes. And you haven't asked me a single question. Oh, right. Well, to tell you the truth, I've been trying to think of what to ask, or even what to say. And I haven't been able to come up with a single thing. And whose fault is that? Mine. Absolutely. I mean, you've had ten years. Yep. And nothing to show for it. You know I'm just giving you crap, right? I figured as much. So, if you don't have any questions, let's just talk. How does that sound? That sounds good to me. So what do you want to talk about? Okay. I see what you're doing. How about you? How have these past two weeks been for you? You know what? I'm going to say good, actually. Really? Yeah. Or at least better than you might expect. Well, that's not saying very much. I would have expected the last two weeks to be absolutely terrible for someone in your position. You know, and normally I would have said you're right, but something about everything... I don't know what it is. When Sydney told me about... None of it was a surprise, I guess. I don't know how, but everything she told me, 
even about my dad, it felt like I already knew it happened and had time to come to terms with it. You know what I mean? To be completely honest, no. But I think I understand. The weird thing is, it's the little things that have been getting to me recently. Like my car. Your car? Yeah. My Camry. <laughs> Apparently, Sydney sold it after Dad died. Which is fine. I get why she did it. Things were tight. They needed the money, but... God, I'm gonna sound like such a brat right now, but... Well, that was my car, you know? I had a lot of memories in that piece of crap. I totally get it. It was sort of a running joke that the only reason my parents kept letting me see Travis is so that he could fix the stupid thing for free. Any truth to that? Oh, totally. Why pick love when you can have free car repairs for life instead? We both laugh as she says this. For the briefest moment, I see a melancholy smile cross Charlie's face. And that's another thing. Travis. He's been through so much, and he's changed. But in some ways, he's exactly the same. I can tell deep down that he's still the boy I met in biology class. The one who took me out for burgers after getting a B-minus on his midterm, and was a perfect gentleman the entire time, I might add. Would you still run away with him? He told you about that? He did. <laughs> wow. You know, would it really be considered running away at this point? We're both adults. This is true. It's also not really an answer to my question. No, it isn't. Charlie gives me a knowing smile, then looks around the room. The past two weeks have really been about figuring out what's the same and what's different. The stuff that's changed is scary. But luckily, I'm finding enough stuff that hasn't changed to make it more bearable. Like this room. It's like I never even left. Sid told me you helped her clean it out. I appreciate that. It's the least I could do. You may still want a vacuum, though. Yeah, I noticed. Almost on cue, Charlie begins to cough. <coughs> mildly at first, with her mouth closed, <coughs> but quickly she turns away and hacks into her elbow a few times. <sighs> wow, that's gross. I'm sorry you had to see that. It's fine. Are you okay? Yeah. The doctor said my lungs are messed up for some reason. I heard about that. And before you ask, no. No? You were going to ask if I had any idea what happened to make them like that, right? Well, I wasn't going to say it like that exactly, but along the same lines. Believe me. I wish I knew. You don't remember anything? Not a thing. I remember fighting with my mom, going to school, texting Travis, running out of the school... And that's it. And even that's a bit fuzzy. Next thing I remember is waking up in the hospital. I see. Sorry to disappoint you. There's no need to apologize. Do you mind if I change the subject? Oh, um... I mean, you didn't have any particular questions you wanted to ask me, right? I mean, not... not really. No. Then do you mind if we talk about you? Me? I mean, you already know my life story. I think it's only fair I get to know about yours. You have a point. So what do you say? I suppose it couldn't hurt. Yes. What do you want to know about me? I want to know how you got into the journalism business. Because I can see you as a nervous little freshman in high school, joining the school paper and climbing your way to the top by senior year. Really? <laughs> yeah. I'm right, aren't I? Tell me I'm right. Actually, my high school didn't even have a newspaper. Seriously? Seriously. That's disappointing. I'm usually good at this sort of thing. Sorry. Then what was it? Tell me you were at least a journalism major in college. Okay, I'll give you that one. But only after a year of being undeclared. So what made you want to be a journalist? I just sort of... always enjoyed finding the truth. <laughs> well, that is the biggest cop-out answer I've heard in my life. What's wrong with that answer? <laughs> Well, it's not exciting at all. I feel like someone like you needs a catalyst. Like, one thing to make you dive headfirst into the deep end of the pool that is investigative journalism. Really? Am I wrong? Charlie stares at me. Again, I feel as though she's looking right through me, 
Like she already knows the answer to her question and is just waiting for me to confirm it. Well, am I wrong? No. No, you're absolutely right. So what is it? I'd really rather not say. Charlie seems to sense my discomfort and changes the subject. Oh. Well, what does your family think about your career as a newsman? Well, my parents were just thrilled I finally found something I wanted to do with my life. What about your sister? As those words leave Charlie's lips, I feel the blood drain from my face. My stomach begins doing somersaults. I look at Charlie. At her eyes. Those eyes that seem to see everything. What did you say? I said, what about your sister? Or brother. How did... You just seem like the kind of person who would have siblings, you know? I feel a chill come over me as Charlie continues to look at me. Are you okay? Yeah. I just... I realized I have somewhere to be before it gets too late. I quickly stand up and start walking towards the door. I'm stopped by the sound of Charlie's voice. Was it something I said? I turn back to her. No. No, of course not. I just... I didn't realize how late it was getting. Oh. Okay. Charlie stares, crestfallen as she sees through my lie. I'm sorry if I brought up a touchy subject. No, that's not it at all. I I just... I honestly do have a meeting I need to get to. That's all. If you say so. Listen, Charlie, I... Yes? Thank you for talking to me. I'm glad I finally got to meet you. And I'd like to talk some more in the future if you're okay with that. Well, I'd have to see if I can fit you into my schedule. I have lots of people to meet, places to be, you know? I can't help but laugh when she says that. She smiles as I do. Well, if you're available, I'd very much like to continue this conversation at some point. When I'm more prepared. You mean when you have stuff to ask me? Yeah. I'd like that. Good. I do have to go now, though. I'm sorry. It's okay. I'll see you later. Yeah. With a smile, I walk out of Charlie's room and back downstairs. After collecting my things and saying goodbye to Sydney, I head out to my car and begin to make my way to Travis's place. As I approach Travis's mobile home, it's immediately apparent that he's been doing some cleaning himself. There are three large garbage bags just outside the door. Beside them are a couple of milk crates full of empty beer and liquor bottles. I'm able to hear movement inside as I reach the door. After a brief moment of hesitation, I knock. Travis? Yeah, one second. He opens the door with a smile on his face. Hey, man. As he does, I catch a glimpse of his living room. The interior of Travis's home has undergone a transformation not unlike Travis himself. The old, worn-out aesthetic remains, but the carpeting looks vacuumed, and the furniture has been rearranged. The space is virtually free of trash and can smell the harsh chemical scent of household cleaners. The place looks nice. Huh? Oh, yeah, (laughs) thanks. I've been trying to sort of redecorate, I guess? Make the place look presentable or something. Travis's eyes drop down to the recorder in my hand. His smile fades. You brought the, uh... Is that okay? Uh, yeah. No, it's fine. I can put it away if you'd rather. No, it's good. I should have figured. Really, I I don't mind. Dude, it's fine. Just don't make me sound crazy when you're done doing whatever it is you're doing. I'll do my best. Come on, let's take a walk. Need some air. Travis and I walk aimlessly throughout the scrapyard. He doesn't say anything for quite a while. He's doing his best to hide it, but I can tell that something is weighing on him. Eventually, Travis sighs. He produces a pack of cigarettes from his shirt pocket and holds it out to me. You want one? Oh, no. Thanks. More of a weed guy, huh? Um... I'm joking, dude. Lighten up. Jesus. Travis puts a cigarette between his lips. In one smooth motion, he pulls his lighter out of his pocket and lights it. He takes a long drag as he returns the lighter to his pocket. This is my first one in a few days. Trying to quit. Again. How's that going? (laughs) You tell me. I'm doing better than the last couple of times I tried. I've got a little motivation this time around. Charlie? Charlie. How are things going with her? I mean... She's been stuck in a hospital for the last two weeks. Well, aside from that. Aside from that? Really fucking weird, not gonna lie. Travis stares at the cigarette between his fingers. He wrestles with giving it one more puff before deciding against it and throwing it down in disgust. (sighs) Shit. I stare at Travis as he crushes the cigarette into the gravel. I feel like I should say something, but decide it's probably better to wait for whatever it is he's trying to tell me. You know, it's just... 
she's been gone 10 years and I've wrestled with that fact and cried over it and drank over it and I've just been a fucking loser in general because of it and now she's here and there's this part of me that wants to just act like everything is exactly the way it was I mean why not right the last 10 years basically don't exist for her so why shouldn't things go back to how they were but at the same time it's like Fuck, man. I'm a wreck. Look at me. I'm not who she thinks I am. Not anymore, at least. People have been giving me shit for the past ten years and treating me like I'm this... I don't know. And for the longest time, I didn't let it get to me. I knew who I was. I knew they were wrong about me. But I don't know. Maybe I guess I got tired of it all and started believing it. Even if I didn't kill Charlie, I could have because that's just the kind of person that I am. So I just ran. But not very far because there's no way I would let myself actually get away from all of this bullshit. Because I deserved it. And I've just been sitting here way out in the boonies just waiting for something to happen that'll finally give me an excuse to just get it over with. I'm not sure how to react to anything Travis just told me. From the look on his face, it seems that he's slightly embarrassed by his outburst. He fishes his cigarettes back out of his pocket, puts one in his mouth, lights it, and takes a long drag. He doesn't seem to fight the need this time around. Sorry, I don't know where that came from. You don't need to be sorry. I promise I didn't ask you out here just to listen to me bitch about my problems. That's okay. I think you're more than entitled to a little bit of bitching. No, I know, but- You're allowed to be upset. And angry. Honestly, I'd be surprised if you weren't. Thanks. So why exactly did you ask me to come out here? Travis sighs heavily as he makes his way over to the hood of an old broken down sedan. He sits with the thud that echoes through the scrapyard. He continues smoking his cigarette. I can almost see the wheels in his head turning as he formulates his thoughts. Finally, he speaks. Oh boy. So, something happened to me the day that Charlie came back. Something happened? Yeah. Yeah. You remember how I had to end the first interview we had because I had a migraine? Yes. Well, when I woke up the next morning, I still had it. Nervously, it Travis begins to explain to me the events that transpired the morning of Charlie's seizure, reappearance. I guess. His migraine, head, his seizure, and what came really after. Think, but then all of a sudden, it just stopped. The craziest thing was, after all of that, I could hear her. I heard Charlie's voice. She was calling out to me. Saying my name, almost screaming it. Are you sure you weren't just imagining it? Absolutely sure. I'd know her voice anywhere, even after all this time. And I swear I heard it, but I... But? You're going to think I'm crazy. I highly doubt that. I wasn't hearing it. Like, hearing it, you know? It was in my mind. I could hear her voice, plain as day, ringing around in my head. And I knew, I knew that she was alive. And that something was coming. I could feel it. When I looked outside and saw the ash falling from the sky, I knew I was right. Then the chief called me and told me that they'd found her. I did my best to sound surprised. I've spent the last two weeks trying to forget the whole thing. Chalk it up to my brain finally melting from all the heavy drinking and shit. But every time I see Charlie, I think of that morning. And I feel like she knows about it. Like in her subconscious or whatever there's something in her eyes the way she looks at me it's Charlie but there's something else in there now I should probably stop talking Travis flicks his cigarette butt away and pinches the bridge of his nose I sit in silence processing everything Travis has just told me I told you I sound like an insane person I stare at Travis Silhouetted against the setting sun. My gut response is to tell him, Yes, yes, you do sound insane. What you've just told me is impossible, like something out of some schlocky horror movie from the 70s. But then I think back to the necklace, and the strange feeling I got when I was looking at it. It was eerily similar to what Travis Warren claims to have experienced. Then there was Charlie herself. The things she said, the things she seemed to know without even realizing it. I'm crazy, right? I've lost it. You know, Travis, I honestly don't think so. 
After saying goodbye to Travis, I make my way back to my car. The sun is gone now, and the gravel road that brought me here stretches ahead into the dark forest. A slight wind blows, bringing with it a chill that cuts through me like a knife. With a shiver, I get into my car. As I drive back to town, my mind begins to race, combing over the day's events. I keep thinking back to the necklace, the strange shape carved into it. What was it? Why was it hidden away in Bill Cooper's tape recorder? I'm so lost in thought, I barely have time to slam on my brakes as my headlights illuminate something laying in the road. Less than 10 feet in front of my car, I see a deer, a buck. It's dead. My fingers tighten around the steering wheel as I stare at it. A mangled pile of flesh, hair, and bone, laying motionless in the middle of the road. Its head appears to be crushed. Tufts of blood-soaked hair peel back to reveal a shattered skull. Large chunks of bone are missing, leaving a gory mess of blood and brain matter exposed. My stomach begins to churn. Quickly, I throw my car door open and retch out onto the gravel below. I wipe my mouth and close the door and sit back up in my seat. I look ahead once more and suddenly let out a scream. The deer has moved. It's standing up now. Its smashed in head hangs off limply to one side, its tongue lolling out of its mouth. Blood seeps out of a gash along its throat. The light from the headlights shines back at me from its glassy, lifeless eyes. I feel every muscle in my body tense up and I find myself unable to look away from the horrifying sight before me, though I so desperately want to. The deer takes a single, convulsing step forwards. Immediately, my head starts pounding. It feels like it's trying to break out of my skull. The deer takes another step towards the car. Its head starts to flail limply from side to side. It looks like it's laughing at me. It continues taking step after shaky step towards me. I cry out in fear and throw my hands in front of my face. I bring my legs up to my chest and curl into a ball, sitting in my seat in the fetal position. I close my eyes tightly and scream at the deer to go away. I can almost feel the ground shake with each step the deer takes. I can feel it getting closer and closer until suddenly... It stops. All of it. The pounding in my head is gone. Apprehensively, I open my eyes. There's nothing there. The deer is nowhere to be seen. The spot in the gravel where it was laying is undisturbed, like nothing had ever been there. I let out a silent, painful chuckle that turns into a sob. My clothes are soaked with sweat. I take a few deep breaths to compose myself. Hesitantly, I check the back seat of my car just to be safe. Everything seems normal, like nothing had happened at all. I stare at myself in the rearview mirror. I don't think Travis Warren is crazy, but I'm starting to have second thoughts about myself. With a sigh, I shift my car into drive and make my way back to town. I don't stop again. By the time I reach my motel, my hands are sore from how tightly I've been clutching the wheel. I seem unable to find stable footing as I get out of my car and head towards my room, stumbling towards the door. My hands shaking, I fumble with my wallet as I attempt to find my room key. My head is starting to hurt again and everything seems to be happening in slow motion. Eventually, I'm able to locate it and I shakily swipe it through the card reader on the door. It takes a few attempts to unlock the door as my first couple of swipes are either too fast or too slow. It's difficult to tell which. With a beep, the door unlocks. Quickly, I stumble into the room, slamming the door shut and locking the deadbolt. I fiddle with the light switch before I make my way over to the sink and splash some water in my face. I feel sick. My head is pounding again and the reflection looking back at me from the mirror looks pale and distorted. Walking over to the bed, I wipe my wet hands on my pants in a half-hearted attempt to dry them. A chill runs down my spine as I feel something in my pocket. My fingers are cold and numb as I attempt to fish the object out. When I'm finally able to do so, my heart sinks. I know exactly what it is I'm holding without having to look at it. I open my clenched fist to reveal a small piece of bone. Animal bone. Maybe from a deer. My heart begins to race. It's the necklace. The symbol carved into it feels like it's burning itself into my mind as I'm unable to look away or drop it. All of a sudden, everything around me seems hazy and my vision begins to blur. I fall back towards my bed. I lose consciousness before I even hit the mattress. As I sleep, I begin to dream.
A dark figure walks along a lonely stretch of highway, silhouetted against the moon. In his hands, he holds a box of matches. As he walks, he carefully removes a match from the box and strikes it. The burst of flame casts a shadow on the asphalt, though the shadow is not his. He drops the match, which fizzles as it hits the wet pavement. He repeats this for a while, lighting matches and dropping them, listening to the hiss as they're extinguished. He is lonely, but he doesn't mind. There were others once, but that was long ago. He's used to the feeling. He thinks of where he's been, as well as where he's going. He's missed it, and he's missed her. He can see it now. The town is mostly asleep, but a few lights still remain. His guiding stars. He stops and sits in the center of the road. He closes his eyes and listens to the sound of nature all around him. The wind blowing through the trees, the clicking of insects, the snapping of twigs and crushing of leaves as a nocturnal beast moves unseen along the forest floor. He opens his eyes. It's been far too long. He removes one last match from the box. He lights it and watches the flame dance in the breeze as it slowly makes its way down the wood. As the flame reaches his fingertips, he winces and drops the match. He looks at his fingers shiny and raw where the flame touched them. He smiles. The pain is comforting. It reminds him of home. Night Falls, California is a production of Night Falls Media. Episode 4, Dreamers, was written and directed by Alexander Gregg and Robert F. Wilson, with original music by Tyler Tingey. This episode features Robert F. Wilson as Scott Sinclair, Alexis Ross as Sidney Cooper, with Harrison Langford as Travis Warren, and Jordan Aspen as Charlie Cooper. Want to know more? Visit nightfallsmedia.com, where you can find links to our social media, new episodes and new shows, merchandise, and more. Also, consider supporting us on Patreon, where you can get early access to episodes, exclusive merch, and behind-the-scenes content. Supporters on Patreon get access to new episodes a week before anyone else, and they only pay when new episodes release. Visit patreon.com slash nightfallsmedia to learn more. Thanks for listening.